Okay, sounds like we're live. Um, uh, we at GPLS have been discussing a couple of things uh, that we uh, internally that we thought had some import to the community. Um, the first one it is subtech, and um, we have one of our library systems that's uh, using self-check probably more than any other system has ever done it, sort of as their main self-check. They, they, it's, it's Live Oak, which is uh, Savannah. That's one of our largest systems, if not our actual largest system. And so, um, by the way, we're, we're broadcasting. So if you have questions or comments, feel free. But we have to do it in the microphone. Um, <clears throat> so um, we've had kind of the same self-check system for I don't know, seven, eight years maybe, uh, based on Dojo, among other things, and it's just gotten a little stale. There's some um, usability issues, uh, like text size was one of the complaints. We've gotten some, some useful feedback. Some of this is just sort of browser settings, things, sort of training people to do that sort of thing. Um, do you want to elaborate? Um, no, I, I started a document just to kind of outline some of the existing bugs and as well as um, some of requested feedback that we've gotten from the library. Um, so most of this is just pulled together. Um, just in general, I mean, obviously the Angular uh, they started a version on Angular JS, but recommended that we scrap it <laughs> and start fresh. Um, so while we're doing that, we could take the opportunity to tackle some of the other usability issues with it, uh, you know, make it more friendly for touch screens and for mobile devices. We're seeing more demand for uh, it being used in outreach in uh, different situations that didn't exist when it was first created. Um, there's a few like little usability things that there's been bugged up for a long time. Like right now it's using the same field for username and password and for entry barcodes. Um, so for it, that's very confusing to patrons because they don't read the text next to it. <laughs> so they don't realize they're being asked for different things. They're just saying the same field. Um, so, so various things like that. Um, we've also had requests to make it more visually apparent when a user's logged in versus when they're not because people tend to walk away while they're still logged in. Um, so just having it like a different color design login screen or something would be useful and to make the log out button more prominent. Um, uh, we'd also like to add the ability to take payments via Stripe through there. Um, that's currently the only credit card processing system that our libraries are using. Uh, and I think it can do other kinds of credit card processing right now, but not Stripe. Um, Jason Stevenson was going to be looking at that a little bit, um, not sure how far he'll be able to get help from He's on our, he's on the call. So. Oh, hi, Jason. <laughs> Speak up if you have anything to add about that. Um, we'd also like to add in the ability to do uh, renewals without having to rescan or re-enter the item buses, so it's easier for patrons to understand. Hey, hey Jason. <clears throat> um, and a few other uh, little things like improving the error handling. Oh, yeah. Um, and then we have, we have recently run into with Live Oak, they are trying to run it without a printer attached. And the model that it was designed for was to always do a receipt. Um, so if we do have the option to email if they have email in their account. Um, but we'd like some better way to handle that, so, you know, whether it's a workstation setting or something like that, so we can just not even show the print option if there's no printer attached. Right. Yeah, That's and as and, far as we've gotten this. Yeah, and in, in, in that case, in this particular use case, the the library running it is running on Chromeboxes, and that's that's why they don't have attached printers and things like that. So, anyway, uh, you know, s some of this is your mileage may vary, but really, we, we see this as an opportunity to improve that particular feature and and maybe come up with something resembling a requirements document that somebody could grab and either done through our development and the door. You know, particular to you know build you just sort of grabbed it and you know mocked an interface and we're good right <clears throat> right so if it's a scratch your itch thing and this is a 
something that appeals to you, that's that's one of the reasons we're pulling this out, uh, highlighting. Now, have um, there been other? Uh, is, is anybody else in here actually using it anywhere? Yeah, you, you guys are there. So, have you had other feedback um, from the libraries on what it should do? No. Uh huh. Oh, okay. So. <laughs> we'll just we'll just let Bill summarize what he just said for the the, zo the zoomers on the call. Oh, sorry. <laughs> the question was about other people using self check, and I kind of think that we use it very heavily. We that's how most of our circulation happens. Um, and some of the features that are listed in the list here are stuff that we've done locally, which we did. Um, so you can see the list of the items checked out and then renew them in line. Um, kind of like what you can in the catalog and the login on one page because that one too. But uh, I would yeah. rather it be on the community version in Angular. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, uh, any other questions or comments about Subtech from online or Jason, did you want to say anything? Well, I just want to ask, has this uh, has link been shared anywhere else? Because I don't know. We're, we're working with some audio. It sounded like it was coming out of the computer speaker. Maybe there's an output issue. Do think it's headphones? Can you hear me? <laughs> right now. Well, my question is, has it, where has this document been shared? I haven't seen this. Uh, Taryn's going to put the uh, put the document out. Uh, it's currently not shared, but that's okay. That right this second. And I didn't hear everything that Bill said, but it sounded like they've got fixes for a lot of this or some of this. Yeah, yeah, he said that, uh, Bill said that um, there are fixes that they've implemented locally at KCLS, but it's heavily modified enough that it's not contributable back, so he wants to, he's on board with the redesign. Okay. The link is in chat for the Zoomers, and I guess we'll, we can uh, follow up with an email to open Alice and all maybe with a, a link to the document so everybody's got it. Uh, I just had one um, thought that because um, doing self check or being able to configure the self the individual self check stations, um, if they're implemented as workstation workstation settings to do that, does this push us forward to kind of find some kind to work on the admin interface to push settings into workstations now that everything is stored server side? or substantially for server side, is that something that we should include as a, at least a stretch goal or a nice to have so that you know when you want to push the don't print at this self-check um, setting onto that self-check workstation, uh, you don't have to you know, clone the workstation or set the workstation up on some other computer and take it out of it. You can just go into an admin interface here are the workstations in my building, and I have to, to adjust them right. and push, push that. Right, and that would have value well, and we, across and a lot of things. And something we talked yeah. about when Bill first brought up the idea of moving everything out of patch of local storage into um, the uh, service. Right. We need a, an omnibus. Mega setting management page and do things like take an old setting and link it into a station setting type. Because uh, right now, if you have the do not print old user setting, literally the mega old station setting is going to database and copy the setting type over. Um, so, step one, turn it into a workstation setting. Step two, apply it. And then it would magically work if it was, it, it, it would cascade through the workstation. Setting. Yeah.
Okay. Uh, so, so good ideas. We'll, we're uh, recording that in our document, and um, we'll we'll make that widely available for people to, to see. I don't know if that maybe that just gets linked from Launchpad somewhere. Um, I mean, the, the bugs are already there. Maybe not omnibus wish list bugs could come through. Okay. <clears throat> so the bigger thing that we're talking about today is reports. And just to give you background, so um, I guess in 2015, 2016, Times uh, implemented uh, Quick Reports, which was written by Emerald Data Networks. And it's sort of a off to the side add-on that uh, gave users a simplified view of the reporter. It took away um, all the decisions about folder management, things like that, and just made made us able to really just have a canned reports interface. Um, and it was a huge hit in time. Like, I, I think it's fair to say that most of our libraries depend on quick reports. And, and often the tickets now that come in say, can you provide me a quick report for X instead of just, you know, I need a report for X. And it's funny because they, cause they, they really don't like going into what we, we internally are calling the advanced reports interface. Um, and you know, no one can blame them too much for getting a little confused in there. I, I train this all the time, and it's very complex. So um, we would like, we've been talking for the last couple of years about bringing Quick Reports function, functionality into Doc Evergreen you know, so that it's just integrated somehow into this. And so we, <clears throat> as we were talking about this in an internal meeting in our office, um, hooray, we have an office. Um, <laughs> um, and that's exactly why we love having an office, is we can just sit in somebody's office and, and get, get work brainstorming things. Um, but we, um, we had just this huge brainstorm about how we were going to, uh, how different ideas about how we might look at reports. So the main thing that came out of that idea was we would like to develop to bring into Evergreen the functionality that exists in Quick Reports, we would lose the term Quick Reports and probably, in reality, just call that, as far as Evergreen goes, Reports, where it's a simplified interface and that's what most of the staff have access to, is sort of a canned reports environment. And then in um, the advanced reports or template creator area, would be more reserved for staff who have the permission to create templates. Um, and it would be less expected that sort of every old staff member that can run reports would have also create you know, functionality. And so we took, Tiffany is excellent at taking verbatim notes as they are happening. So she just sort of recorded our conversation as best we could. I think she might have missed the calling as a court stenographer. Um, but she, um, we, we've taken that and with, with some help from Elaine Hardy has put this into sort of an outline um, for uh, sort of our wish list about the way we'd like this to work. Um, yet the proposal is basically not to change very much about the mechanics of how reports are run, like Clark Kent, all that. That's all fine. Um, but this would be more making the interfaces friendlier to the, to the end user staff. And I, I think it would be a win for everybody. Because running quick reports now is an off to the side thing. It uh, it requires running PHP. Um, we're we're even having to run again through PPAs to even have it run correctly, <laughs> which is not not an ideal environment. Um, I can understand why administrators wouldn't want to have that added burden, but it works for us and it's been great. We would like to have this done in whatever or eight whatever the you know, current version of Angular is um, in the same sort of way. Um, what else do we want to say about this? Um, well, I think um, what we, so building on what Chris already said, we talked about having, you know, reports be the main visible one, Facebook reports be the top reports. Um, there would be, uh, although we wouldn't really have to touch the existing reports interface much, we would want to kind of hide that from public view unless they have the right connection. And then um, we had a few ideas for how to flag different reports that we built in the custom reports creator to be included in the new reports interface. 
So there would be a few fields that we would need to add to the existing reports interface. Um, we could do it a few different ways. Um, the feedback is very much encouraged. You're welcome. Um, one thing, uh, one idea that we had was to just to add a flag into a report template saying this should be visible in quick reports. Um, and under this next category, so the drop down with categories. In that case, we would need to have an in admin interface to control what categories were, probably. <coughs> um, and uh, another option would be to have kind of a, a set folder um, where anything, any report template that we copied into that folder would appear in that structure, in that folder, subfolder, subfolder structure in Quick Report. So we could just copy them over into that, and the categories would be displayed based on the folder name. Um, <clears throat> um, so there would be those few additions to uh, the regular report interface, the custom report interface. So we also added something in our quick reports where we have a just a, basically a two option um, little category where we display things as either counts or lists, right. meaning some calculations or uh, detailed lists, and that helps our staff understand what they're going to get before they run the report. So if they want detailed versus um, versus just numbers, uh, so I think something like that would be a nice little add on to the existing report as well. And um, as a kind of add on to that idea, if we could preload a set of standard types of reports into there, sort of like we preload the action triggers and things like right. that, that would be nice. Um, so that a new Evergreen implementation wouldn't have to start from scratch. <laughs> um, and so the uh, new flip reports interface to show you what our book like. Yeah. Um, so we basically almost did a skin um, of what um, the report. Oh, you can just go to the report. Oh, yeah, the report. So um, if you click view quick report from here, um, what we do is we just have a preset list of uh, categories. And we have these categories hard coded, but that would that's an idea that we can go away from. Um, but if you expand one, it gives just the reports that we have specifically said that are, you know, these are the reports that our staff are going to use the most. Um, and then when you run it, it looks similar to the existing uh, report template. Um, I think we could actually skim in this even further, make it a little bit even more user friendly. Um, one thing that confuses staff a lot is uh, where it's asking for each filter. It lifts off the full field path, and staff has no idea what that means ever. <laughs> so, um, I thought maybe we could do something like use the um, field help. Um, that field that already exists, and maybe display that instead of just the rest of the path, and just display the field path with the field help that exists. Or we could have a new field or something. Uh, something to make it a little bit more user friendly. Um, we've collapsed um, some of the other options, like under the show all options, um, like at the bottom. We've collapsed like all the output things. So they can modify that if they want to, but it can be with most people. They just collapse it by default. Um, that's pretty much the, I mean, I think just starting from there, just making the few modifications that we've made already has helped a lot. Mm -hmm. um, they don't have to select their own input or their own folders to save things into, which helps a lot. Um, it automatically saves based on the category names that we see set. And so if they go into their, their output folder, which is a different class, My, my quick reports. 
<laughs> so it has the exact same output folders and so they know where to go to get those. And I think we can reuse some of those ideas that work really well, you know, not replicating the exact way but similarly. Yeah, real, really just taking away a lot of the, the choices it improved the usability a lot uh, in this regard. Um, and then, so those are, you know, two iter uh, related projects. And then another kind of side project um, go back to the is we talked a lot at the last Evergreen conference about the idea of a statistic dashboard in Evergreen. Yeah. And so we were thinking we have this executive report feature. Yeah, this, this is a very so, popular thing. So um, we set up a series of scripts on the back end that run on a monthly basis and populate a new database table that just stores these numbers, those snapshots of this database based on the previous month. And then if, um, um, so they can run it on um, their branches, make it they can see multiple um, and it also has a, it will also sum or aggregate the system level, which they didn't understand in regular distributed. Yeah. So they can run this with, um, they have a preset list of data that they can choose from. So this is just all the various sets of distributions to each one of these basically. And then they can just choose back to when we started to get up two years ago. So we can use whatever month they want to see. And our, our libraries um, understand that this is a snapshot. That, that's been hard to explain to people about every report is actually a snapshot. They, they don't really see it that way. They're like, but why does my report from today look like look nothing like the one yesterday? What they really like is that it's mm -hmm. formatted. <laughs> So it, yeah. it, it aggregates whatever pieces of data that they selected from the checklist, puts them in a nice little chart, and pulls in the comparison from the previous month and previous year. So they have something that they can just send to help with the number of the board, um, or they can also pull it up. In and if Jason Etheridge sees familiarity here in the, uh, the concept of the uh, reporter inf interface that uh, you developed for times that's definitely uh, that was definitely the inspiration for for this piece was um, the directors uh, libraries really loved that interface and ever since we got on evergreen they're like well, there's that thing Jason wrote and like everybody mm -hmm. talks about um, who, who remembers it and this this gets pretty close I think to what you were you were doing probably having like pre-run data that they could just sort of point and click and grab Well, this is too. Honestly, this is ugly on the back end too. So, so um, you know, and we haven't thought about like how would these exceptions be added? And yeah. probably that would have to involve programming. Mm -hmm. The data that was going to be added um, just can just be a chart to a dashboard. Right. And like a new dashboard. And, and again, to, to highlight what I said last year and, and uh, the move, move toward a dashboard model is that uh, since Evergreen is now in direct competition with you know, off-the-shelf ILSs, and they have those, and they're also, this might be a way to add value to Evergreen that's not in a lot of those off-the-shelf ILSs, uh, is to take some of the features that these um, third-party add-ons like Edelweiss and uh, Collection HQ and things like that, because really, Every time I've gotten those requests, I'm like, well, you know, you can run reports and get the same data. But they, you know, it's the pretty interface that really attracts them, them to that sort of ease of use of you know, quick filtering and stuff like that. Um, and if we could add even pieces of that into Evergreen, that I think that would keep us um, on the cutting edge of, you know, like I mean, a lot of people don't realize Evergreen can do lots of stuff that off-the-shelf ILS can't do. But this this would just be another piece where 
you know, you're not having to pay another extra few thousand dollars to have this module. This is just built in. So. Yeah, but we love feedback. That's really why we brought it. So everybody. Um, so one of the things I was in the brainstorming session that Chris alluded to. Um, one of the questions I had, because like he said, you know, Pines is hot on the ready to try this, but the one thing we don't want to do is collide with any uh, any new report development. So in Angular 8, so because it was not on the roadmap, I thought because we're all in the room together, just getting the same, no pressure, but to put you guys on the spot. But I mean, if if, if this is something that's coming up and Two months, three months, you know, we probably hold off on that. But if it's further out, then we might take an initial go at it. So, okay. Gotcha. Okay. That. We, yeah. We all we that answered the question. We just we wanted to make sure to ask the question because we thought if we didn't ask it, and you guys. You know, are on the ready to port right. it over, then we would be pretty foolish for right. the competing effort at the same time. So. Just to summarize the last, the other half of that conversation that you might not have heard for the Zoom folks, um, uh, Equinox folks said that they've, they've had similar thoughts internally, but they don't have anything particular on the horizon at this point. Um, and same with Bill. So um, I think. Uh, I mean, the, the main thing for us is obviously this touches a lot of what everybody's doing, and we'd like this to be a community-wide project with buy-in and, and everything. I mean, it's, you know, so we, you know, we, we did quick reports on our own because that was something our libraries just needed right away, and we didn't, you know, there's like there is now no no movement towards any sort of redevelopment of reports. So I think. Um, but really, with this next go round, we really would like Evergreen. We'd like the Quick Reports functionality to be actually in stock Evergreen, so everyone's able to use it. Um, everyone agrees, and it's not written in some off to the side dependency that we don't have to, you know, that other people have to worry about. Um, it's actually just part of core. So, um, thoughts on that? You're talking about taking all the best ideas up to implementing an angular over the None of the functionality goes away. Right. Everybody gets it's a new everything they have. It's a new interface in. that gives so you know ninety percent plus of people of libraries. They don't want all that. They just want their simple give me my new users, give me blank. You give them a fast pathway to that and allow people who want to get deep into data still to have the ability to do that. Gotcha. I just want to be careful about this. We spoke a little bit of the impression that we have all these reports to find users. We, we're going to make them we, part of that we spoke for 40 minutes on terminology, like the importance of making. Yeah, so so that is that is that is. I'm I'm glad you said that explicitly. The idea is not to take Pine stuff and just sort of you know shove it into the community. That the idea is to um, take this infrastructure that we're working with that works really well for us and make it available for everybody. Um, and that benefits others who aren't willing to add this onto their to their sites, but also it helps us because now it's part of maintained for Evergreen, and you know we we of course would. Um, and the creation of the report would still be through the existing. Right, because really, really what we were imagining in our brainstorming was in the in the template creator um, interface, there would basically be a checkbox of is this a canned report or not, and what categories does it go into. Um, and that that would kind of let them be displayed in that menu of acquisitions and bills and whatever. Um, <clears throat> and if not, and, you know, it's a click button, it's a, a, um, a checkbox. So if it, you find out that one of those reports is flawed, you just unclick it and it turns off. They can't see it anymore. So that's that that's already an advantage to, to uh, the way we have quick, quick reports running. It just makes it more integrated. That's the idea. Okay. So it would touch existing reports. Would not replace existing reports. 
Oh, a lot of comments. Uh, okay, so Jane is saying, luckily we have a lot of interest in an acquisitions dashboard, but that would have to be really up-to-date information. Funds, I, I know Tiffany has a lot of opinions about this. Um, wondering how to blend the super up-to-date visual information and the monthly executive snapshots. And then there is a bug report for a dashboard. Um, so we can take a look at, is anybody on Zoom that can just sort of grab that? Jane, do you mind push, uh, posting that in IRC as well, that, that bug, bug link? That would be great. Or maybe you can. Great. So there's already a bug for it. Do you know that? OK. Tiffany's on top of everything. Did you want to say anything about it? Um, I don't, I, I mean, I agree that this is something worthwhile. I mean, it, it goes in with the dashboard thing. Um, I mean, I agree with Jane, though. This would have to be, like, up-to-date information. It couldn't be, like, the can we run it once a month kind of thing. So um, I, can't, I almost think that's, like, a different beast, maybe. Like, a, like, I need it right now. Like, um, I don't know how that would work on the back Yes, so it's, yes, yes, exactly. <clears throat> and it's being stored at that point. So, like, it's a snapshot, so a year from now you can't see that data as it was unless it's separate. Right, right. I just thought, because um, my initial thought was just, uh, like, what the um, person sees being, like, a nice pretty chart, you know, like a pie chart or whatever. But then, like, then clicking the button, I want to see this. I don't know, there'd be like a report that does that, and then the data just takes back into the chart. I don't know if that's the point. So, I don't know. Well, I mean, we, we pull in live data to the interface all the time. So, I, I, don't, I, I think that there might just be different mechanisms for each section of the dashboard that grabs the data. I, I, that's what I'm envisioning. Here, so, um, the other comments were there was Debbie said she thinks it would be great to have something like this in Stock Evergreen. That's good to hear. Um, we have been waiting to implement this at Biblio for a while. It would be a lot easier on us if it was part of Stock Evergreen, of course. That is definitely a comment that I've heard from other system administrators out in the, the Evergreen world, that they would love to see the functionality, but they're not willing to put the uh, PHP dependencies in and, and some other concerns as well. Um, and uh, OK. So do, uh, does anybody have concerns about this direction, problems with it? Look at Mike Rylander. <laughs> if I know two really talked about actual the actual path of coding, um, but in broad terms, are you looking to uh, take the pieces of the reporting infrastructure that um, maybe have too much visible, but you could hide some of it, to make more use of it, turn that into Angular, and then add on more there, so you like upgrading toward Angular, the interface that everybody has to use, and adding on that make use of your hand reports and categories and things like that? That is one option. Um, we hadn't really discussed updating the existing uh, infrastructure other than just adding those fields. So were you but talking yeah. about doing it in Angular JS? Or um, I guess the I guess the report template like the the, the template interface is Angular JS, yeah. yeah. But the report um, definition and output interfaces are all in the yeah. Yeah. So they're going to leapfrog over them. Yeah. So that but yeah that was kind of asked, like Adam's question about when that work was on the horizon because. Okay. So some of well, it would have to be done the, twice. Yeah, yeah, and then again I mean, later. But, always yeah. It's always yeah. Yeah. I wonder if for the for the pieces that are dojo or 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 even earlier than that right now, there's the the, the soap uh, <laughs> table field thing. Um, if it leapfrogs the leapfrogs the angular, and then if you see that it's a hand report in the category, you just drop out. You just don't those are sections that are not relevant. 
you know, but then, at, you know, we, hopefully my relatively minor efforts, when it's not one of those, bring back, bring back, perhaps in a much better layout that is less confusing to people, but bring back the other capability. So it's one interface that only has to be written even more. Yeah, so so because of the dependencies in approach A, which I think would be like the more prudent approach, like to start with existing infrastructure of current reports, grow it into Angular, and then hide, because we aren't seeing, like our team can't take that on, but we're not, we're not, we're not ready to do that. So we're probably going through a, approach B, and we had a long sort of back and forth, Adam, Adam, Tiffany, Taryn, and I and Elaine um, last week about this, because Adam, Adam was trying to make your points you know, in, in the same, in a similar way, <clears throat> and, and there was a little bit of a disconnect. But basically, his main point was, you know, we're, if we do it now with what's there now, we're going to have to do it twice. And you just need to go into this eyes open that that's the way it's going to work. So I think in the same way that Quick Reports was kind of a Band-Aid-ish approach, this will also be a similar Band-Aid-ish approach just inside Core Evergreen. Um, and uh, then with the overall goal of hopefully meeting in the middle and redeveloping. I mean, because we're really, even the Angular 8 point brought up earlier this morning, you know, we're always going to be having to upgrade this constantly, right? <laughs> right, see, yeah, exactly. Well, yes, that's it's true that we're always going to be on a set, but the, the, you know, right now we would be, be, be jumping from a stone wheel rolling down a hill onto a peloton. We move mm -hmm. from old move forward to definition of the and, and then, then it's just <laughs> yeah, that 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 is that, those points were made. Yeah, so so right. Well, okay, so so this was this was sort of it. We, part of part of the unknowns is like, ideally, we would at times come up with a requirements document for this that we pass on to the community development initiative. But the community development initiative then passes it on to contractors, and then those contractors, you know, have us a product within you know a year or something, and so our impression is that things are a little bit bottlenecked development wise because there's, there's just not enough hands right I mean, we've got, you know, they're only even you know we've got pretty much most of the players in this room who can actually do the coding uh, and then a few online um, and I don't know we're like we're we're, <laughs> we're internally trying to grow our own development skills at times we'd love to hire a developer ourselves etc cetera, etc cetera. work this law blah 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 but Basically, we're trying to um, handle that, but we're trying to make it so we're talking about a year and not, you know, three years or four years. I guess that's sort of the concern. Does that make sense? And that's realistic to consider it that way, right? I mean, okay. Okay. Yeah. Oh. I'm on the hook. Okay, so Jeff, um, the the question is: so the the existing Angular JS reporting with the combination of Dojo and legacy stuff that precedes Dojo, as Mike referenced. You know, my 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 main question when we discussed this last week and we're discussing it now was: it, it is uncanny how much Mike and I are asking the same question of doing it twice because that's exactly what we're looking at. So the idea is 
do we now, and I think we're leaning towards this in the conversations we had with Heinz folks, is the answer is yes. So we're going to appeal to writing a UI to the existing AngularJS code um, to allow users the experience sooner than later to make use of this. Knowing with eyes wide open, we've got Angular 8, Angular 9 out there that we're going to have to rewrite this. Um, because to, to rid ourselves of the, the albatross of Sega. So uh, is that said? And I think the executive reports, um, you know, being a basis for you know a new dashboard section, that could all be just new Angular. I guess that's a totally separate um, process with scripts that we need to back in. Okay, good. Yeah, so so really, we're talking about three three separate projects. One is you know bring in bring in quick reports, which is kind of, and, and it's funny because we came back around. That's how the conversation started. How do we bring quick reports into, into uh, existing Evergreen? So that's kind of back where we are. Second project is reports redo to, to rid ourselves of Evil Dojo and, you know, make it all new. And then third report, or third, um, third project is a dashboard approach for all the different modules. Quick reports interface. How much does it really communicate with the existing reporting? It's Entirely. Is just a, a layer on top. But as far as the interface itself goes, you're looking at something that's different. It is. It can, the way it works though is basically we set up the custom queries like the second view. Um, the the PHP code has custom queries and it can put the you know, PHP connected to the Postgres database. There's an all report data there, parses it out based on, you know, the JSON template that exists there, and then makes sense of it. But it, to Chris's point and Karen's point earlier, the all the reports are still created in the standard fashion. So, entirely outside of Evergreen, huge team developed all this stuff. Why can't you just do that on Angular? That's the idea. No, I mean oh, not Angular JS. Oh, uh, right. I mean Angular. Like, why would you need to write Speed. Well, my understanding. So, so my understanding about. So, my understanding about both Adam, Adam slash Mike's point about the underlying architecture was, um, and I, I actually, my assumption has been Angular non JS uh, moving forward. Um, and but we're cons our concern is that the existing Dojo slash Angular JS infrastructure um, is a dependency for what we're writing. Uh, yes, and, and and honestly, I started where you were, and then when Ad, Adam convinced me, okay, so anyway, yeah, so here we are. Oh. Um, so, um, <laughs> I'm, I'm laughing at the time. I didn't mean to sound like I was arguing for Angular JS version. I was just saying, in fact, I was saying, if you take that larger loop and go to Angular, all the way to Angular to the support definition piece, then with a little extra effort, you send it to be a replacement for everybody. Normal reporting usage, if you just take a look at the flag that says, do or don't go to quick report stuff, is changes. And then everybody. Okay. Sorry. No, I, I I think I was hearing Mike backwards. I think I thought Mike was saying we need to start with the Dojo-ish Angular piece that's there now, and then move forward. But what Mike was saying. <clears throat> Sorry. 
Right, right. But this, but yeah, right. Writing the piece that comes in like a shark from the side and. <laughs> If you build quicker ports than Angular, then you're going to have to write some JavaScript and stuff that is knows how to deal with reporting stuff. And then down the road, when someone comes along and ports the existing reporting in the whole they'll probably make use of some of the code that you wrote. But arguably, 90% of it will be its own separate thing. Uh, which to me suggests you save time. Yeah. Any other things in Angular that even though it's being dependent? Yeah, other. It's only, it isn't really dependent on the Angular JS stuff. I mean, it's, it needs to know how to parse the reporting stuff if you're doing the PHP now. So you'll have to add that kind of logic. Um, but the vast majority of what's there now is, is UI stuff. Um, so when you have the IDL, that's already in. Well, that that's great news for us. And honestly, this is why we wanted to bring it to the room because I'm, you know we we have our you know educated guesses about how how much effort we're talking about, the best direction, etc. But you know none none of the three of us on my staff are full time developers, and we we we've, we've done some Angular courses and things like that, but we we're not we're not conversant the way that a lot of people need. So. Um, so are, are people happy about this idea? I mean, are we, we good? <laughs> yeah, that's right. Okay, so I, I guess our next step would be to flush out these ideas further and then just share what we have with well, the development community for feedback. We'll, we'll create a, a launch pad bug, at least one. Uh, we will um, post something to the general and dev list, and um, we'll continue the conversation there. <laughs> I, I found it very helpful when you did the demo, and you listed all the things that your staff like, um, and even just having those in a wiki page with the bullet would be, I think, that's just Yeah, I, I think you're right. Are we good? Okay. Uh, that's all we have. Is there anything else on this part of the agenda? I, I expect people to do it on this over time. Yeah. Yeah. And if you, if you know, you, if in the heat of the hack away, you're like, aha. <laughs> so please, you know, please let us know that there's a cool idea you had about it. So. All right. Thanks, everybody. All right. Well, I think that does it. Um, Thanks to everybody online for putting up with all the mic business. And if you have any um, questions for us or really anybody in the room, you can you can go to IRC and ask, or um, I don't know, call one of us or something. <laughs> all right.